Boom, I'm back. Ah, I feel better. I'm back, everybody. Welcome to the best podcast in the world. Guess what the giveaway is today? Maps Prime. If that's what you guessed, you guessed right. So we're going to give away free Maps Prime program. Here's how you can win. Leave a comment in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Help us with the YouTube algorithm. We're crushing on YouTube, and we want to crush the competition. So help us out. Leave a comment. If we pick your comment, we'll notify you, and you'll get free access to Maps Prime. Also, subscribe to this channel and turn on your notifications. One more thing. One more thing. Maps Strong and Maps Power Lift, both great strength-building programs. 50% off. Go check them out. Head over to mapsfitnessproducts.com. Just use the code August Special with no space for that discount. All right? Enjoy the show. Dude, I had my, uh, my first post-illness uh, workout this morning. Oh, you did? I did. I haven't yet. So I did you ease into it though, yeah, or did course. you go crazy? No, you know what? This is a good, actually, a good thing to talk, a good topic to talk about too, because um, oftentimes when we're ill and then we feel better, we go back to working out, and we tend to. And I, this, I always fell for this too. I would have this mentality where I would jump into what I, you know, what I, where I last left off. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? So I'm, oh yeah, I was doing you know, six sets for each body part. And this is the weight that I was using. And I've learned my lesson so many times. Well, I haven't learned my lesson so many times where <laughs> I just overdid it. So this time what I did is I, I went in, I cut the volume in half totally. Yeah. Went really slow. And really the goal was just full range of motion. And, you know, I think what people need to know is that's enough to elicit the muscle memory. So whatever you lose, you'll gain back very quickly with a very easy, you know, workout. And I plan on doing that all week. You did too, right, Doug? Did I hear you say you were yeah, back? I did. Yeah. Oh, I'm just the I'm the <clears throat> only lazy bastard here, huh? No. You're the slow one here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you just want to <laughs> stay fat. Just, just sitting around buying stuff. Bro. No, bro, I'm getting shredded right now. Yeah. Nothing tastes good. That's so that's okay. The, Is your taste still messed up? Yeah, that came later for me. So like I would say day five or so, it really started to like initially I remember when we were all talking, everybody's on the phone going like, Hey, you guys, how's everyone's taste? And I was like, Oh, mine's fine. And then like day five, all of a sudden it, it started. And it's uh I have taste. It's just fucked all my taste and smell up. It's weird. So everything just tastes huh. different. Yeah, taste and not good. Really? Yeah. So food has just been is, soup is like the best tasting Bro, thing. This, right? You might have just stumbled upon the best cutting diet of all time. Yeah, no, the, <laughs> I was gonna write the bat soup diet. <laughs> imagine bat soup diet. Imagine if food just didn't taste good, how yeah. easy it would be to lose weight. Yeah. That sounds awesome. No, I lost my sense of taste for like a not even a day. How mm. weird is that? Literally for one day. That's it? That's I swear to God. So for one day I was eating and I'm like, oh man, I lost my sense of taste. I'm like, I know this usually takes a couple weeks. The next day, hmm. back. Oh wow. So, you know, here's oh, a weird wow. here's a weird thing that I got. I got a very strange rash. Oh yeah, I saw that. Yeah. You sure that wasn't like an Ooh. STD thing? Yeah. It was Where was it? On, yeah. On my bunch. It was all up and down <laughs> my bunch. Right? Yeah. yeah, he yeah. sent me a picture. Here, hold on. Let me show you guys. <laughs> yeah, that's, no? All right. That, that, that's a friction rash. Yeah. I yeah. No, I wasn't. Yeah. <laughs> no, I didn't get anything on my bunch. No, I was, uh, I was in the, you know, I took a shower and I get out and I kind of look, I'm like, am I breaking out? That's really weird. Why the hell would I, and it looked like I was kind of breaking out on my shoulders a little bit. And then I looked down on my forearms and it, it kind of looks like. I'm, I broke out a little bit, but it's it's a, it's COVID apparently can cause rashes in people also, which, I, which is an unknown. I didn't know this. So I had a very, very, it's very minor. So it's not that big. Now idea. Jessica rebounded pretty fast. You said, huh? She seems to be, she seems to be rebounding pretty quick. So she's like three days behind me. Yeah. And I would say aside from feeling tired, she, she seems to be okay. And then the baby, he had a fever two nights. During the day, he didn't. Then two nights, he had a fever, and then now he doesn't have anything. Mm. And he seem, he just seems a little bit more clingy right now, but that's it. Other than that, he seems okay. So, all Oh, good. that's good. Yeah, but yeah, as far as the workouts are concerned, when you're after an illness or injury, like literally throw away what you, re what you, what you normally consider to be an easy workout and go much easier. Yeah. And you'll bounce back very quick. And then give yourself a time frame. That's what I have to do with myself. I have to say this whole week because I know what I'll do is I'll do one workout yeah, feel good and then try and go right oh, after sh it. might as well go yeah. hard tomorrow I feel phenomenal and then you yeah. end up overdoing it and you know and slowing down your progress or whatever so today I was just going easy Doug and I were 
literally it was like a 25 minute 30 minute you know kind of pump session or whatever justin i see you all over the place were you what were you doing down in slow yeah i was down there for my kids had this gymnastic kind of tournament thing um dude i've been super active the last you know week or so we haven't been hanging out just been between moving stuff and then also like double days for football like because i've been able to get work done and then like remotely uh i was actually able to get there on the field and uh Dude, I've been working out. My metabolism is raging right now. I'm eating everything in sight. Uh, it, it's crazy, man. Yeah, but look, uh, we, went really we went down to – what's that? I said you look really handsome. Thanks. Sorry. Uh, yeah, sorry. I've been trying. Out, out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it's um, – I went down there, and uh, this is my first experience with gymnastic people. So um, <laughs> <It's a gymnastic. laughs> it, was, it was a bit of a culture shock for me. Uh, I didn't really know where to stand or, you know, how to hang out or anything or like where cheer to, and stuff. Where to, where to put your hands. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, what do I do with my hands? <laughs> like put them in your pockets. Cause you know, it's creepy. Um, yeah. So there's lots of spandex and, um, certain colors that don't really appeal to me, if you will. Like the, <laughs> it was kind of funny because, um, so they have like specific uniforms they have to wear. And it's, so uh, my kids had on these like, like really tight, um, uh, tank tops that were like unitards almost. And they put like these little tiny shorts on. You know? <laughs> and, and, I was, and I was trying not to laugh, but they're having fun with it. You know, they're kind of making fun of each other with it, but, uh, dude, they did it really well. And then, uh, actually after the first day, like Ethan was trying this one move that was like some crazy brawny thing that like they have this huge foam pit where he's doing these like triple flip things. And uh, he actually landed one after that uh, on, on the trampoline and then got some award for it. Oh, so really? I, I was like, Oh yeah. <laughs> That's super awesome. pumped for him. So yeah, I was super, super proud dad moment. So there's definitely a, a, a culture there's definitely because I remember you guys remember when we did the kettlebell yeah. the kettlebell competition here. Yeah, yeah. There was a like kettlebell sport. We actually hosted an event, and all of us were you know this is for the listeners. We were all kind of blown away that they have the, their own culture. Like everybody had like a, a, a particular brand of bag and shoes, and everybody kind of and of course right. There's a culture for every sport: bodybuilding, it could be jujitsu or whatever. So I would imagine gymnastics has its own kind of culture too. Did yeah. you did you oh, yeah. did you see a lot of that? Is it clicky or what? Yeah, well, I think a lot of the parents kind of know each other beforehand and so like me and Courtney were just kind of I mean we we were trying to be friendly and introduce ourselves to everybody and not be like total um you know like hermits over in the corner, but uh it was still it was still like who's who it was kind of like a status weird kind of rich people sport you know where it's like uh it costs money to to, <laughs> to get these kids like all uniformed up and go to travel and do all these things so it's kind of like clicky in that sense where um it, it, i don't know it was it was a certain kind of a, a snobby kind of a feel to it uh and then also just like like who's what program they have their kids in and like, they're all talking about like, you know, like all this like higher education stuff. And, and we're just like, cool. You know, like, is anybody just like chill and normal or is this <laughs> like, you know, well, the sound, it's like the who's who of what, you know, to, to Sal's point is, was there like uh, I mean, was there like uh, chairs and outfits or bags or things like, I mean, were you up and up on like uh, how you were supposed to look? Yeah. So there's like track suits and um, mm. there's there's bags for sure and, and there's um like they they all they all have like tight really tight attire um, <laughs> that, that they're rocking <laughs> and um, that's the parents know, the parents too y yeah yeah and it's like wild like it's like bright pink was like a color of uh, you know that they chose for the all the boys to wear and I was just like dude I'm not having this you know. Like, I don't know. I'm old school, dude. Like, yeah. uh, like that's that, that, you know what? In Arizona, they, they force prisoners to wear bright pink, uh, to humiliate them. So I, that's where I'm coming from. Is that true? Uh, yeah. So, yeah. Really? Yes. Yeah. There's this one, uh, prison ward, like guy or whatever he, he, you know, who runs the prison and he makes everybody wear not only pink, uh, but also pink underwear, I think. 
What? It, yeah, and it, yeah. Was, it was just a yes. To That's a real him. thing. Uh huh. No yes, way. Yeah. To emasculate him. Yeah. 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 So anyway, I mean, it's, obviously, I didn't care. I'm like, I'm not like forcing all my shit on everybody. But I was just like, it was interesting for me uh, to to get immersed in that. But then there was there was some um, Olympic athletes there coaching them, and and um, it was pretty cool to watch the strength and the feats that they could accomplish. So. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of like really cool stuff there for sure. I, I, this well. is like so interesting to me right now. You didn't now. know that, huh? No, I did not know this. Now, this, okay, this Arizona, Doug's pulling it up right now. So this Arizona prison. Yeah. Now, did he make just everybody do it or was this, was this everybody. punishment? No, oh. everybody. Oh. Yeah. So, yeah, everybody. Huh. But, yeah, pink socks, but pink he, underwear, pink shirts. Huh. But all like the hardest dudes, you know, look, they all look ridiculous. And it's <laughs> like, it sort of like brings them down a notch. You know what I mean? <laughs> How now, did now did you read anything on it? Like, was there any research as far as no like, research? It, I think he's just you know he's just trying to show everybody what time it is. I'm going to make you wear this. Yeah, you know, I, does it do yeah, anything? It was a power move, you know. Yeah, so, yeah. It'd be interesting to see if it like calmed the fights down or whatever. Like, if they actually did some research yeah. on it to show like it actually. That'd be, yeah, that'd be interesting to see if it worked. But I don't know. Everybody has to wear you know bikinis, you know, or whatever. <laughs> just, <laughs> that might backfire. Yeah, right? uh, <laughs> I yeah, not, might. I know this. yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's hilarious. Yeah, I, there might be a new problem. Yeah, I, I just imagine you walking in there and everybody's like, oh, who brought the, the skater or the who, mountain Who brought cholo? the meathead skater cholo? Yeah, yeah. what yeah. is going on <laughs> over here? Yeah, I know. That's why I was trying to find my people and I just, yeah. you know, I didn't have luck. Well, gy- it's gy- okay. Gymnasts blow me away always. I'll never forget. I trained a, she must have been 14, a 14 year old gymnast when I, way back when I first became a trainer. So I was like 18 or 19. And this mom hired me to train her daughter. And she was this little 14-year-old girl. And, you know, typical gymnast, right? She stood real tall posture kind of because they're, you know, they're pretty jacked, right? They've especially been in training since they were kids. And I'll never forget this girl. I'm like, well, can you do a pull-up? And she's like, oh, yeah. And she jumps up on the bar. Reps out. Like this. Like, like I remember the look on her face didn't change. And she had her legs pointing straight out in front of her as if it would like to show me. <laughs> you know, oh yeah. Not only can I do pull-ups, but I can make them harder, and they're really easy. Yeah. Incredible strengths. Now, do both your boys enjoy it equally, or does one like it more than the other? Um, I think. Well, I think Ethan's actually taken to it a bit more, uh, just because Everett's so hard on himself, and he's three years younger. So it's like he's trying to do all the stuff his brother can do, um, and, and stay up, you know, in his class. And you know, he kind of struggles, and and so he gets really pissed off. Uh, when he can't like do a certain move and then um, the coaches try and coach him and he's just like, no, I can't do it. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, buddy, what does he take you got to keep weird. trying. I know. It's I, so strange. It's weird. Yeah. It's, I don't know where. Hey, I don't by, know where that, by the that way, can you, can you step back a little bit? I want to see your shirt. I just want to say, oh, wow. Mm, Look yeah. at that. That's a weird looking clown. Oh, they, put a, they, put yeah, a clown no, they put a clown nose I on a snake. Found, That's pretty weird. I don't know. <laughs> some, t- some tyrant clown. I that's, don't know. I just looked like a cool shirt. Yeah, yeah. That's, I like that shirt. It's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. Dude, so yeah. Th- this weekend was my grandfather's. I told you oh, guys. Oh, that's right. Did you write the speech? So uh, I wrote the speech. and Obviously, I couldn't go, right? Because I, you know, whatever, bat soup disease. But I, uh, I, re- I came here to the studio. Doug recorded me and they played it at his birthday. So my cousin calls me, FaceTimes me, and he says, oh, they're about to play your speech. Oh, cool. Right? So he, he's pointing at my grandfather and my grandfather's just bawling. It was so, it was, he was, he was crying and then my grandmother was crying. Oh, and, oh man. It was, it was really, really incredible to see. And 90 years, right? My grandfather's 90 years old. And his story's so crazy when you think about it. Like he came, he went from Sicily to Venezuela. That's where he went first because he, he, he had to find a way to make money. While his wife was in Sicily still, he would send money back. Then he went to America. Then my grandmother got on a boat because they couldn't afford planes or you know a, a airplane ticket. She got on a boat with two big kids. My mom, which was a baby, and my uncle, who was, I think, uh, he must have been two or three. So three-year-old and an infant. My grandma speaks no English whatsoever, gets on a boat and comes all the way over here and basically survives and feeds the kids like hard cheese and salami because that's all they had. Wow. Comes all the way over. And my grandfather, you know, I mean, he started a legacy. He's got 
four kids, 13 grandkids, 13 great grandkids, plus two more wow. on the way. All because he now, did your, had the bravery to do that. Did your parents meet here in the Champion. States? No. So my mom came here, obviously, when she was a baby. And then when she turned 18, she went to Italy, to Sicily, to visit you know, the, their, the, the family. And that's where she met my dad. Actually, what happened was she went to a family party. So she's 18 years old, right? So she's at this, uh, or 19, at this family party. My dad... Could they have a uh, they have cousins that are friends or something like that? So they all were at the same party. So my dad's at the party, and he sees my mom, and he's like, "Oh my gosh, I, I love her." <laughs> so he tells his cousin, <laughs> he doesn't even talk to her, tells his cousin to tell my mom that he's interested in dating her. My mom remembers him because she saw him at the party, so she agreed. So this is how they this is literally how they dated. So they agreed they were engaged because this is how old school they are. You ain't going out unless you're engaged. You can't uh, even go out once. Oh, wow. Engaged. Then then they would go out on dates. And the way – did you guys ever watch The Godfather when um, you know Michael Corleone goes, goes to Sicily, meets uh, Apollonia, her name was? The girl, remember the, the, the Sicilian girl that he meets, mm -hmm. and they're going. Yeah, I vaguely remember. And they're going anyway. It's it's part two. It's Godfather Part Two. Great scene, and they're going for a walk, and and it shows them walking, and then behind them is like literally the parents, the whole family. Oh, wow. this was mm. what my dad and my mom did. They would go for walks. This is how they dated, and then behind them were grandparents, parents, aunts, yeah. uncles, no, kids. No pressure. Yeah. It, like a crowd <laughs> of people would follow them. And my mom tells a story. She says that I asked my mom, I said, what was it? You know, what about your first kiss? Like, did you guys have a first kiss before you actually got married? She goes, oh yeah. yeah. She goes, we were walking with the whole family following us. We turned the corner so that we were around the corner and your dad <laughs> grabbed me and gave me a kiss. Oh, wow. And she said, and I got, yeah, I got, snuck one in. I got, she says, I got so nervous. I almost threw up. I got nauseous because I thought my father would find out and I would get in so much trouble, <laughs> but nobody ever, nobody ever found out. <laughs> So, yeah, no, that's wow. a that's a true story. But yeah, so you know, my grandfather got, and then he calls. You know, after after it was done, you know, I got to talk to him on Facetime, and uh, he's you know basically I'm his favorite grandchild. So <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But the he, speech solidified it. Yeah, yeah, no, but he was just he's just you don't you don't know what you do for me, Salvador. And he's you know he's crying. And it's the thing about my grandfather I love more than anything. I even said this in in the, the speech that I did. My grandfather is one of the most proud tough like he's just like one of those just tough macho proud sicilian men but there isn't a single family event not one where my grandfather within five minutes does he cry if it's a if it's celebrating anything i don't care it could be literally my cousin drew a picture that everybody's looking at he'll be in the back <laughs> and you'll see him he'll he'll have his glasses i might me and my cousin sep used to used to laugh at this well like, oh, oh here he goes watch this and he'd be in the back. He'd lift up his glasses. He'd start cussing under his breath because he'd be pissed off that he's crying. <laughs> and you'd, you'd hear him go, God damn it, son of a bitch. And he'd wipe his eyes. Oh, I can't. I, uh. And then he'd walk away. <laughs> Every single event. But I, I love that about him. You should, you should make a drinking game out of that. It'd yeah, be great. No. But it was, it, was, it was very nice. I wish I was there because the family was there. But Hey, speaking of good. cool, proud moments, uh, I saw uh, T Nation hollered you. Man, that's awesome. Oh, yeah. They, whoop, whoop, they, whoop. They, they put the resistance. Yeah, train. finally well, they recognize, huh? Well, I do want to say this about T Nation is that, uh, and we've said this before on the show, one of the better, I guess, fitness and health sites that you'll find. They typically science-based. Oh, yeah. they've been The articles they've been putting out for a long time, I mean, we've been- They're counting. one of the better ones, yeah. for sure. Good information. So to, to have them recommend the resistance training revolution- was uh, a huge honor because I respect them. I, I really do yeah. respect. Here's the funny yeah, thing. Super cool. Here's the funny thing, though. I'm going to call you guys out over at T Nation. So Adam sends a picture. Was it you that saw yeah. it first? Yeah. Sends a screenshot of the rec that they recommended the Resistance Training Revolution. So I'm like, why don't I follow them on Instagram? I couldn't look them up. I looked them up, type them up, couldn't find them. I'm like, what? So then I went to the Mind Pump Instagram page, looked them up, and there they were. So I'm like, they blocked me? <laughs> so they must have blocked me a long time ago <laughs> for some reason. I wonder why. I must have got on a, a under one of their posts and promoted one of our programs or something like that. Who knows? Yeah, I don't know why that would... You know, sometimes I, I'm sure it's like, a, like what happened with that company Eat to Evolve, right? It's probably somebody yeah. who's... Yeah. 
you know, doesn't know who you are and just sees one thing and then decides, oh, we're going to yeah. block because of that. Yeah, so I messaged them from the Mind Pump page and then they unblock me. So you now. know who blocks everybody too? Mike O'Hearn. Mike O'Hearn is a big oh, blocker. Yeah. He's a big blocker. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, oh, he blocked you? Yeah, I've been blocked Still? by him for a long time. That's so what? funny. Yeah, I yeah, talk yeah. to him all the time. What, what'd you do to him? I, I don't even know. I didn't do anything. I don't think I ever said anything about... Competing hottie, that's why. He's yeah, like, oh, I gotta uh, block this guy. Yeah. yeah, there's only been a hand. Yeah. Uh, there's only been a handful of people that have ever ever blocked me. Mike O'Hearn is is one of them. Uh, Bradley Martin was, and then um, Joe Donnelly. Joe Donnelly. Yeah, those are. Yeah. Oh no, no. Yeah. And, he blocked uh, all of us. And uh, what's his face that you always used to make fun of? Joey Swole. <laughs> oh god. Oh Swoles. Yeah, yeah, he, yeah, that's those, the only one that blocked me. I, I like yeah. him for his. He, he didn't like my impersonations. Apparently, I, I like yeah. his investment advice, Joey Swole. <laughs> <laughs> He's such a swole. <laughs> Such Literally, a, my favorite thing that's ever happened on the internet. Brilliant. So, He's brilliant. Yeah, I saved that. Yeah. I saved that. Where video. are they now? Do you know what's going on with them now? I don't know. Who the hell knows? Yeah, I don't yeah, know. They're, they're still they're, making money, like scamming, you know, people on the internet somewhere. Crappy supplements. Let's be honest. Yeah, something well, like I remember he. I think he was a part of that one company, Rise Supplements. That that uh, right afterwards, after the big fall of Shreds, I thought I saw. Yeah, he started him and Bill Zarian. I think became buddies. Uh, yeah, which right. is always interesting for me to watch. Uh, you know, these these influencer people start to connect with each other. And he and, wrote a book and, recently. You know that? Who? Dan Bilzerian. Did he really? Mm -hmm. What's it? What is it about? <laughs> well, probably his life. Yeah, gambling and girls and, <laughs> yeah. and partying. Yeah. Like I'm tired of banging. Yeah, <laughs> the title. Yeah. 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 I don't know. I don't do you guys do you guys think that yeah. uh, well, obviously we don't know the guys so this is pure speculation but do you think he's actually a happy person Hell or do no. you think he's not no 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 I think that yeah, I, temporarily maybe you know but I think after you've kind of done it all it's it's we talked about this off air a while back like you know part oh my of, god you're right look at hold on the title of the book rich and thick with chicks. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, right? I, I knew it. Rich and thick of course. with chicks. Wow, dude. <laughs> hey, listen, ladies. I mean, that's, that's solid. Ladies, if you meet a guy and you go over his apartment for the first time and this book is in his bookshelf, get the fuck out of there. <laughs> yeah, Quickly. You, you better run. Yeah. So you don't yeah. think... So you, don't drink anything. So you no. don't think he's happy, huh? No. He does seem like he's medicating, right? To try to distract himself with the chicks. Or either that or he's just a brilliant social media person and it's just a, a I think great there's way. a little I think I think there's a little bit of brilliance there with him too. I don't want to uh, I don't want to not give him credit where credit's due. I think that he saw the opportunity in that space early on. I mean, he was the first big like I don't know what you would like, playboy on on Instagram, yeah. you know. So. Oh yeah, he, he he's the closest to Hugh Hefner we've seen yeah. since. I mean, so I'll I, give him that. Yeah, I I agree with that. But I also think too that part of uh, I for personally, personally for me, half of the 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 enjoyment of, you know, monetary things that he has a ton of uh is the pursuit of it and the struggle. The yeah. struggle, the failure, like having to get back up five or six times before it finally works for you. Yep. And so I think that when you have that kind of money, success, and fame, I just feel like you lose part of that. You've already, it's so easy. It's so easy to obtain all those things. It would be interesting to see like what he needs to do in order to get a rise out of, you know, or get how to make something challenge, what's challenging for him. Also, the other thing too, I don't know, again, I don't know the guy, which is based off of his social media, okay? But for me, all that success, monetary success, would actually be very sad if I didn't have family and like meaningful people in my life to share it with. It would mean it would yeah. be, mean so little. If anything, it would be I would feel more sad that I have all, money and all the stuff and I don't have those people to share it with. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. So it, and, it's just overindulgence. You yeah, know, it's yeah. like uh, eating all of the junk food and all of the candy all the time. Yeah. yeah, like it's it's just Which not going to temporarily. I think that was is probably fun and enjoy, I mean, I'm sure there's a he went on a run there where he probably did feel like reminds, life was amazing. Reminds me of that Twilight Zone episode I've brought up many yes, times, yes, where yes. the guy. What a great, by the way, this is a great episode. I've talked about it before, uh, but I gotta yeah. say it again. In this particular twi Twilight Zone, great, great old series. If you like twists and great writing, and there's this guy that dies or he gets shot in a shootout. He's a bank robber. Then he like is presented with this looks like an angel, this guy in a white suit, and he goes, "Hey, welcome." He goes, "You can have anything you want." He's, and first he doesn't believe him, and then he believes him because he's got a palace, he gets all the money and girls, he goes and gambles every time he throws out the dice, he wins, and then like it's like a, three months later, 
they show the guy and he's like, you know, obviously he hasn't shaved. He's depressed. He rolls the dice. He wins. He's like, this sucks. No matter what I do, I get everything. There's no, there's no thrill. There's no risk. There's no whatever. And then he calls the angel back. And he goes, what, 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 this is terrible. He's like, I, I, I couldn't imagine. I never would imagine that heaven was like this. And the angel goes, who told you this was heaven? And he does this evil laugh yeah. as if to say this is hell. Like, ah. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, it's really, really, uh, you know, really interesting. No, that's a great yeah, one. Yeah, anyway. Good stuff. Hey, I read something very interesting about CBD I wanted to tell you guys. Hmm. Okay, so. Uh, All right. Disclaimer, this is a study. So we'll post the link up so everybody knows I'm not trying to be crazy or whatever. But here's the title of the study. Cannabidiol, that's the name for CBD. So cannabidiol inhibits SARS-CoV-2 replication and promotes the host innate immune response. What? So CBD, we've known for a long time to have antiviral properties, and it seems to have antiviral properties for COVID as well. Oh, interesting. Yeah, wow. so it's a really interesting study. They're actually doing further studies to see if this actually works it's you know actually works in what people. is cbd not good for i know it's true huh <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> I'm, I'm, they've been able to connect it to everything that's true right yeah 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 i know but it's very interesting that it, now cbd was thc didn't show this although thc is anti-inflammatory it was just the cbd now here's the thing why i i had read this a while ago so back when i was sick i was also taking um the ned on a regular basis i didn't tell anybody because I don't want to promote any false whatever, but I was taking it on a regular uh, regular basis. That was kind of part of the whole... I didn't. I wish I did know. Part of the whole thing. Yeah. But interesting, right? I didn't know. It's well, very isn't it interesting? It's the, the adaptogenic type of herbs and things that are now kind of uh, getting a lot more publicity. It's like you, th there's just so much benefit to them. Uh, and you see that it too in all the different types of uh, you know medicinal mushrooms and uh, you know, CBD, it's like, if you keep, you know, taking them sort of on the regular, uh, it helps to kind of, you know, even everything out, it seems. Yeah. Speaking of which, I saw that documentary, Fantastic Fungi. Oh, you did? Oh, yeah. What'd you think? Wow. I started watching it too. Wow. Is that- Isn't it a trip? Yeah. Super good. I was just at the part where they talk about how they they communicate all underneath, like all the, uh, to all the trees and everything like that. Well, I mean, it's, it's very interesting because there's- potential applications for creating fungi that eat pollution, that eat oil that we spill in the ocean. Um, yeah. There's that guy that modified a fungi to become a pesticide. So instead of spraying yep. chemicals to get rid of pests, you just, this is this, you know, fungi that really doesn't have any negative effects on humans, but it'll kill termites and stuff like that. And then they got into the psychedelic mushrooms uh, and the research mm -hmm. behind that. That was Mind blowing. I haven't got to that part yet. That yeah. really blew me away. They actually showed two people who were terminal, so cancer. Uh, so there's a woman who had uh, terminal cancer, and then a man who had terminal prostate cancer, and they signed up for this study. So one of the hallmarks of having a terminal disease is the severe anxiety and fear that that you know surround it, right? Because sure. you're you have to face your own mortality. Your doctors are like, you're not going to make it. So all of a sudden, you're like, oh, my God. And so people just get tremendous fear, anxiety, and depression. And so mm -hmm. what they did with what they did with the study is they, they did some therapy sessions leading up to the session. Then they gave them the mushrooms. They put uh, you know, a blindfold on them, headphones. And then the therapist was there, very safe environment, talking the person through what they were going through. And one of the guys, uh, they showed this one man, and he's after one session after he was done. And this guy had severe anxiety. He was treat, he couldn't mm -hmm. control it. After one session, he says, I, I, I'm at peace now. I ha it brought him yeah. so much quality of life. He goes, I'm not afraid of dying. He's like, I'm at peace. And you could see it in his face. Wow. Really, yeah. And they filmed his session yeah. and he's like crying and you could tell he's processing. Really mm -hmm. crazy. I was telling Jessica as we were watching it, I, th I don't think people realize the potential revolution this could have for mental health i feel like the news has slowed down around that there was a like just like a year or two ago i feel like it was ramping up like crazy i felt like every other podcast episode you were sharing new study comes out or new state gets on board decriminalizes like i haven't heard i haven't heard much there's still a lot of stuff studies going on and i didn't know this but in the 60s in 50s and 60s before they they uh you know scheduled m magic mushrooms and lsd and all of the psychedelics so illegal that you can't study them. Right before that happened, 
it was there was research was exploding, right? So psychiatrists were and scientists were studying it like crazy. You know, one of the first things they found with uh, psychedelic research in this, I think it was in the 60s, they found it to be effective at curing people of, get this, alcoholism. So alcoholics, wow. people who had were struggling with alcoholism. Now, I've heard about that for smoking. I've heard it's cured people from being addicted to cigarettes. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I'm not familiar with, with those, but these were old studies on alcoholism. That's one of the hardest things to kick. And apparently, oh. these people did these sessions, and many of them quit alcohol. Boom, right there on the spot. Yeah. It oh. seems like it's like the ultimate introspective therapy. It's like you you sort of put yourself, you assess everything that you know, all the habits, all the things that you do. Like even Paul Stamps, his story was pretty incredible. That he grew up stuttering. Yeah, uh, like like couldn't stop stuttering and. His whole family, you know, were all these intellects and went to all these Ivy League schools and all this. And he just had this horrific, like, stuttering problem and then had, you know, a heavy dose of psilocybin and and, and, and came to terms with it and, and was just like, I'm just not going to do this anymore. And then never stuttered again. I know. Now, pretty, isn't the, pretty crazy. Isn't the science around it that, it, it like, it interrupts these pathways? Is that what it is? Like, the things like the stuttering or the addictive, it's like... Part of that is you've got this same pathway that you've this pattern in your brain, yeah, that is just always firing, and then what it, it supposedly like opens up new so there's, pathways. There's a couple theories. They they do show that, right? They do show that it creates new neural pathways or patterns in the brain, um, and it does so pretty effectively, which is good, right? That's a, it, that shows that whatever pattern or thought process you have, that you, this loop. For example, if you have like PTSD, for example you have a really, really terrible event that happens. What happens, it gets solidified in the reactive part of the brain. And then let's say every time you hear a helicopter go off, it reminds you of being in Vietnam or whatever in war. And you and you can't interrupt it because it's, it happens in the part of the brain that reacts faster than the part of the brain that's logical. So before before you even realize that you're having this this physical reaction, it's too late. You're already in the middle of it. And now it's like, ah, oh, how do I stop it? So these studies show that it does change these patterns, so it can interrupt that. But then there's this other theory, and it's probably both in my that's to, in my opinion. The other theory is that in order to make profound changes in your life, you either a have to do it very slowly. We talk about this, right? Developing discipline, one little step at a time. It takes a long time. It's a lot of hard work. Blah 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 blah. The other way is by having an epiphany, where you have like this big spiritual like awakening event, which, I mean, how do you recreate that, right? So what these uh, what these substances are doing for people, because literally one, I think it was one third of all the people in these studies that we've seen so far, if I'm not mistaken, one third or one fourth, something like that, said that it was the most profound experience of their entire lives. Wow. So it's yeah. like, imagine having an epiphany like that. It's so profound. And, you know, that might be enough to get you to say, I'm going to quit you know, you know, doing drugs or I'm going to, you know, quit being an asshole or whatever. Yeah, yeah. So I don't know, man, really, really remarkable. Yeah. Highly it's recommend. Fascinating. Yeah. Speaking of movies, did you guys watch uh, suicide squad? The new one? Anybody? <laughs> I did. I watched it. Dude. Yeah. So why nope. are you laughing? I'm laughing because this is what I want us to do. I would like, and, and, uh, because I think Doug was in agreement with me too. Did you try and watch Suicide Kings too? Uh, yeah, I got about 20 minutes in. Yeah, you and, and then me. I had to kind you of turn weak. it off. So here's, you guys are weak. I also, I also, I'll try it out, Sal. I'll, I'll give you a shot. I'll, 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 I like it, Justin. I don't know, dude. I also watched his stand up comedian. I didn't think it was funny at all either. I want, what I want to try, I want to try with you is, I want you to give me the next bad movie. The next movie you don't like. <laughs> <laughs> I would like <laughs> I, want, I want to try that one. I just want to try it out. I just want to see what, what You know, happens. Rotten Tomatoes gave it 91. 91%. Reverse recommendations. Not, Rotten Tomatoes yeah. is usually pretty pretty. No, odd. it is normally. If especially if they both It was both, like 88 or 91. It was got a really high rating. Yeah, normally those are pretty uh pretty accurate. I don't know, maybe because I was in a crappy mood and I watched it, or maybe because I already have this idea when you recommend it's probably gonna be bad. But normally that would be the opposite. I'm I go into these with low expectations. If you recommend it, I'm like, probably not gonna be good. Did you probably. watch the whole thing? Uh most of it. I got I really got, and you didn't think it was funny? You didn't think it was creative? <sighs> 
I mean, one, I didn't think it was that much different than the first one as far as the create the creative part. I mean, same type of concept, right? But oh, the first one sucked. Yeah, I don't I know. So. Yeah, I just I thought they were just okay. You know, I didn't think it was good. I mean, DC just kind of sucks compared to Marvel, in my opinion. It's it, DC is just not yeah. ever up to Marvel. You know what though? It depends, dude. The the Batman. There's some Batman, uh, you know, installments that have been phenomenal. No, it's true. In fact, I would say of all the superhero films, the best ones were some of the Batmans of all of them. Yeah. So I Batman's would, always been solid, but uh, I mean they've gone real cheesy and hokey too so they have i like yeah it was is it nolan is is like the one with christian bale like yeah. i liked that version yeah, because yeah. it was darker yeah um and the joker but, what about the recent joker that was incredible I actually, well, yeah that, i actually never that was, finished that why because it was so heavy oh disturbing yeah yeah but i mean uh, good though right so I, i'm not saying i didn't want not finish it because i thought it was bad it was just a, it was heavy and i was it like, was well done yeah that was a well done movie yeah i mean any movie where you, i think it, it, it was that i had to turn it off because it was it was depressing yeah <laughs> i was like okay and it, I mean, I mean, it really made you feel like yeah no it invoked like that emotion, creepy. that much emotion in me you know it's well written and well done then but. well so this because this suicide squad essentially and i like it when when uh producers do this with superhero films they either either you take it very seriously which is tough if you take it very serious it's hard to make a superhero film good when you take it super serious i think batman has the best story and it's dark and it's you know it's somewhat kind of relatable yeah. because he doesn't have superpowers well, but you know why because he, he has the best villains yes you can write so much better stories when you have all kinds of different awesome villains that is that are what it is you think you think that's it's yes. more about I the think villains than the, than i think the superhero? all the villains in all superhero like all comic books right of all the villains i think the joker is the best and the because he's he's really evil he's really dark yeah. re, like if you read if you see the comics he is fucked up evil, like very, very twisted and whatever. So I think I agree with you. He's the epitome of chaos. Yeah. yeah. Yep. So it, I think they nailed it a few times when they, you know, had him just just out to d destroy everything, burn the world. Yeah. Now, the other thing that the other side is I like it when they make superhero movies tongue in cheek and they poke fun at themselves, which you know, is what this one did. Who did that the best? See, I, what's what was the one with uh, Ryan Reynolds? I can't think of. It. Oh, Deadpool. Yes, yes, yeah, Deadpool yeah. did a good. Was fantastic. I love Deadpool. Yeah. Deadpool yeah. was fantastic, and I think that is uh, Guardians. Uh, the, which that was also good. Yeah, yeah. Was that is that DC? No, that's, that's not DC. No, no, that's Marvel. Oh, okay. Yeah, both both those are Marvel. Yeah. yeah. So the tongue in cheek stuff, I I uh, you know enjoy. See, too. but there you go. They they Marvel did did that. And I just think they yeah. do it way better than DC, obviously. those Because those two, I thought, those were hilarious. Yeah. Those are really, really good. Yeah. Oh, you know what I wanted to ask you? Um, you know, remember how we had that discussion on dating apps? And I said, oh, I, I wonder if it's giving people too many options. Oh, yeah, we talked and about yeah, did you get? I got some DMs on that. Did oh, you I didn't. No, I so didn't. I had I actually had people tell me that they they agreed, that, they, that it was too many options. I had guys message me and saying, no, what you said I, I tend to fall into, where I don't put... Too many. I don't like put too much focus on one person because I know I could just meet yeah. up with someone else. So I actually had some people say that they they agreed with that. The which question I is, I don't know if that's a bad thing, is it? That's a good question, right? I mean, I is that know. necessarily a bad thing that you don't get all hung up on one because you know there's plenty more options out there? Well, if it's always about searching for the new one, then it could be right because you could miss out yeah. on the one that you lost. I think all in all, I think that there it's it's improved people's ability to find each other than, than anything else. I would agree with that. Yeah. I, mean, I, I also had somebody message me and say that they speculate that there's a lot of married people who go on dating apps when they're kind of unhappy <laughs> to see what else is out there. <laughs> Just to see, like, who's going to bite. Yeah. <laughs> like, hey. Check yeah. their options for the oh, I still like, got it. <laughs> Let yeah. me see. Yeah, this isn't yeah. much of an upgrade. I'm not going to leave. Dude, I read a story. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so trip off this. I read a story of a husband and wife that did that and matched each other. Oh, so, yeah. So the guy went. <laughs> That's the ultimate. Yeah. Like, he, accidentally. Yeah. He went on yeah. the app. Oh, wow. The wife did, too. Then they match. How do you get, can't get mad, can you? I don't know. I mean, so you both get mad and you're like, well, I guess, you know, it's uh, destiny. Yeah. 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 I, yeah. I mean, either that's going to be like an amazing, like, makeup sex realization. Now, do you guys have any, pissed. do you guys have any family or friends right. right now that are close to you that that's how they met? Um, I'm trying to think how my 
cousins who just got married. My, my my mom and her husband did. That's how they met. Really? Oh, my brother. I think that's how my brother met his wife. I think he met her on a, a dating app, if I'm yeah. not mistaken. And she's lovely, wonderful young lady. They're the ones that just had a baby. So, yeah. yeah. Nice. I, I, de I definitely think it's got to help. I mean, it, for you to be able to screen a lot. I mean, because how many times have you dated somebody and, you know, found out either weeks or months later that you were dating them that there was there's just like one of those things. It's like, oh, my God, this will never get past this. Yeah. Mm. Right. Especially There's another show on, on Netflix right now. I, I got kind of sucked into that was all about um, arranged marriages, um, it, you know, in the Indian culture. And it's just interesting to see like so they they basically seek out somebody to, to kind of match them with somebody else. Uh, and it's you know, they, they limit the options down very much to where it's like you get almost like one interaction and then after that, it's like either, yes, I'm going to keep pursuing this person or no. And uh, and then it like quickly leads to marriage, like really fast. Wow. And it's fascinating to see like, you know, how the fam, all the family gets involved. It's kind of like what you're talking about, Sal, earlier, you know, the old school kind of approach. You know, what's weird is that those, that the statistics on the, and I'm sure there's a million reasons why. Isn't the success rate really high? On very high. Well, success. They're very high, actually. Yeah. Success based on. Um, Staying together. Yeah. And I think yeah. it's more expectations. I remember I, I, I read an article on this that. For a long time, marriage was, it was like, okay, we're going to agree to be married. We're going to agree to raise a family. Um, and you're, this, this, you aren't supposed to complete me and make me feel like, you know, like I'm, I'm whole now, right? It's just, we're just married and this is what we do and we work it out, whatever. And then that changed to, you have to marry someone you're totally in love with and it has to be like that all the time and they have to totally complete you. It's all based on the feeling the whole time. Yeah, yeah. and then the article said that that's one of the reasons why divorce rates got so high is because all of a sudden people were like, you don't complete me. You don't make me whole. You don't make me happy. <laughs> you know, which, right. I, which I, I, I could see some truth in that. You well, know? No, I, I mean, I could, I could see that. Well, I mean, that's not true though. I mean, that's not what makes a successful marriage. A good partner and a good teammate, I think that's why. I think yeah. they've, gotten, they've gotten away from that where... If your parents are matching you up, I imagine that's how they were doing it. I mean, you're looking for compatibility with other families and things like that, things that you guys align with, which makes sense. But I think we've romanticized it over years with uh, your, you know, your romantic movies and stuff like that. It's supposed to be this love at first sight and sweep you off your. And feet. you're always gonna feel that yeah, way. Yeah, yeah. You're always gonna yeah, like, yeah. all expectation based, you know, <clears throat> and then it always disappoints. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Speaking of uh, expectations, uh, I was uh, I'm very excited because the pumpkin spice gold juice is I, back. You know what's funny? <laughs> I was going to Get out your hugs, everybody. No, I was... Isn't it early for that? Isn't it feel early? Aren't we starting... I, that's, it, I don't know. That's, that's a fall thing. Fall kind of... Yeah. That, it's like... It's, uh, every, it's breezy right now. Every you know? year, it starts to get pushed back further and further. Why not make it a permanent flavor? It's so good. That's I what I think. There's got to be a strategy to that. Yeah. I feel like there's yeah. there's got to be a strategy of taking it away and then bringing it I back. I can't wait, dude. I, I nice, think it's kind of novel, too, you know, because if you had that all the time, I don't think... Uh, you know, get old. I think I, it, I love it. It used to be like a, a fall get, heading into winter type of thing. That, that those are the flavors of of fall. And now, I mean, where are we at right now? Yeah, it's yeah. like we're in the middle of summer. summer? Yeah, <laughs> it's like I, yeah, we're not even out of summer. Yet. I crack up because it's like when you start seeing like all the stores when they start selling stuff way early for the holidays. Like I think we've yeah. already we've already got Halloween stuff. It's your out. Christmas decorations. You yeah. know, like dude, yeah, it's like July. Yeah. I love it, man. I, with the almond milk, warm. Oh, no, it's that's good. the best. No, man. no, it's one of my favorites. I'm teasing right now that it's. I just think it's funny because I've seen it. I start to see Starbucks and all these guys starting it earlier and earlier yeah. every year, but it is one of the best flavors. Oh, man. I want to tell you, Justin, because I know you're you're into like Disney, uh, like facts and stuff and weird stuff about Disneyland and Disney World. Did you know that they have a protocol for people who uh, sprinkle cremated remains of loved ones at the park? Huh. They they have a what? protocol. Where so, do they do it over like the cemetery or what? No, I where think do they do that? You do it or, like the, on a ride. You do it in the <sighs> park, and they have a whole they have a whole protocol. So if you contact Disney and you're like, listen, my my mom was a huge Disney fan, and her dream, you know, her last wish was to spread her remains at Disneyland. Um, you know, we. I her. never thought about how popular that probably wow. is. Yeah, that's actually probably really popular. Yeah, it's very interesting, yeah. isn't it? And there's a name for it. I got to look it up because I actually wrote it down. 
but you you actually go there and they have this 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 thing that they like a ceremony they, and everything or yeah like, it's it, let me see it's yeah. uh it's let me see what they call I it. I want to be packed into one of those cannons in Pirates of the Caribbean <laughs> you know? shot out yeah. blast <laughs> me out of everybody <laughs> here it is here it is about once a month uh, there's a guest can scatter the remains of a loved one somewhere in the park and the park apparently has uh, like a special thing for it and it's it says no code is kept more under wraps at Walt Disney World and Disneyland than the call for a HEPA cleanup, H-E-P-A cleanup. It means that once again, a park guest has scattered the crema cremated ashes of a loved one somewhere in the park and an ultra fine vacuum cleaner is needed to suck them up. <laughs> what? <laughs> so they go and clean it up afterwards. <laughs> so I don't get it. Okay, so let's say I so I wanted to spread someone's ashes in my family at Disney. Do I call them or I just do it and they find out? I don't understand. What's the I think you're supposed to tell them, but that's a good point. I wonder how many people do it and don't say anything. Yeah. Yeah, how many people do it anyway? Yeah. yeah they just Put it in their thermos. Yeah, you, know? you imagine that, like your spring, and then the what wind gets think, all. What do you oh, think shit. are like the like top five, <laughs> top five places that people want to be cremated and, and and sprinkled over? Where do you think oh, oceans got to be up there? Got to be Grand there. Canyon. I think would be one. Oh, you know. think so? Mm. That's a yeah, well, it'd be a cool place. I definitely think I'd, ocean's got to be like one of the top for sure, right? Yeah, I, yeah, I ocean. Would, I bet Disney's or, up there. Or pretty, lakes. I wouldn't even have thought that till you brought it up. But I'm like, dude, I know so many people that are like super Disney fans. If I Hards. if I die oh, yeah. if I die and get cremated, what I I'm gonna put this on air. What I want you guys to do is I want you to take my remains and sprinkle a little bit in your post workout shake. And just, oh. and just a little bit. Yeah. Just put a little sprinkle okay. so I can become Cheers a, to the homie. Yeah. Uh. So I can I can help, you know, uh heal, grow your muscles. Now I'll if recover. you guys were all if we were all cremated, where would you want to be where would you want to be sprinkled? Mm. I, obviously not uh, in pre workout. I think not, in pre, <laughs> not pre workout post -workout. I wanna be in an Elon Musk rocket to Mars. You know? Shut up. Like like take me all the way. That's not <laughs> realistic. Take me all. I know, it's not realistic. Do you have a place? I feel awesome. like you would be like, uh, take me up to the redwood tree mm. somewhere, some some mountain esque mm. place that you that you love going to. Yeah, or that's uh, true. I don't I'd, know. I'd be up I never really. Doug, thought of you're that. the closest to this, so what would you? Think? <laughs> <laughs> How do you know? <laughs> that might not be true. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, based off of the way things are going, it is not true. You're yeah, be the last one. You standing. are the last one standing. Probably. Honestly, Doug punches I, uh, viruses in the face. <laughs> I've given it very little thought as far as that is concerned because. Quite frankly, I don't think I'd care. Yeah, you know, honestly. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, yeah. All right, now, do you guys have? Do you guys know if you're going to be cremated or not? No, I'm not. I'm not. I don't think I'll be. Cremated. Oh, you're you're like no. I don't actually. Okay, I don't care. But I actually had this conversation yeah. with my parents once. We were like talking. Yeah. And I said, God, I said, why don't people just get cremated? Like, who cares? And my yeah. mom literally lost her mind. Oh wow. Lost her mind. Don't you ever no, Dad, I would never do that. So I'm like, okay, mom, sorry. So Oh wow. Yeah, it was a big deal for her. Yeah, I think I'd be cremated. You want to be cremated? Yeah. Really? Cheaper, easier. Is it cheaper? Right. Oh yeah. It is? Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Much oh, yeah. cheaper. Much cheaper. There's a there's yeah. a yeah. All you need is a little urn. You can do a coffee can and do it like... Uh, <laughs> see, that'd be the big Lebowski. That'd be the move for me. Put Bro, me in a coffee can. Hey, we put him in the chair over here while yeah. we're podcasting. <laughs> hey, Justin, what do you yeah. think? He has nothing to say. Yeah. Um, for sure. There's a, there's, I forgot what culture, but there's a culture that uh, might be in New Zealand where if you die, they throw you off into the ocean for sharks. So to eat. And that's part of their... their you know what the ultimate would be for me is um, like an old Viking uh, where, where you put the body on one of those rafts and then you set it on fire. Oh, with a bow? Mm. Yeah, that'd be sick. <laughs> like Robin Hood? Did you, hey, hey yeah. speaking of Elon, did you see that um, he said that he'll probably put someone on the moon by 2024, I think? Over the next three years, did you see that? No, I didn't see yeah, that. Yeah, so uh, that's are we going to put like a hotel up there? Like, what? Uh, what's the plan? No, by twenty twenty four, by twenty twenty four, he says that he'll probably land humans on the moon before by, before on twenty twenty four. Wow, I know it's around the it's corner. It's crazy. I know. Right? Well, yeah, but what will they do? Is it going to be land and then come right back? Or are they going to build something out there? Like, no, what's... you just land and come back, dude. Mm. Yeah, dude, the anti gravity club. Whoop, whoop. Yeah, what? <laughs> Yeah, everybody's going up there to get some anti gravity action. How many I mean, people? How many people? That's have, the appeal, right? Has there only been two people on the moon? How many people have been on the moon? That's a you question. I have man. no. <laughs> I don't know how many people. Maybe. I don't know. Is it like 
Uh, yeah, I have no idea. Yeah, it's like four, <laughs> four to six people, I guess. I have no idea. I'm pretty sure the U.S. is the only country well, that's been on the moon, right? According to this, no, 12, I, 12 I think people. Russians have been up there after. They have? 12? So 12. I think so. What mm-hmm. countries, Doug, have been on, on the moon, have actually put a human mm-hmm. being on the moon? Let me see. Yeah, you mean so, after we won that race, like people didn't keep going through with it to try and get there? No, of course not. It was a com- then it's not cool anymore. No, you know. Someone okay. already did it. So it's all Americans. Actually. Boom. Yeah, all wow, Americans. Oh, wow. Mm-hmm. There you go. So, okay, so here's this, here's the deal. I was telling Jessica this. Uh, she's Because we, uh, what were we watching? We are watching something and that came up. She's like, why don't why doesn't anybody care about going to the moon anymore? I'm like, okay, this was during the Cold War, and it was a wonderful way for us to flex to show the Soviets that we can la- if we can land somebody on the moon, we can send a rocket in your backyard and set off a yeah. nuke. And that's what it was all about. Once we did it, it was over. Nobody cared anymore. Yeah. And now cool. they have a supersonic nuclear weapon that they just flexed. Cool. Yeah. yeah. That's funny to me that w- that so much energy, effort, money, resources. And time went into getting there, and then once it happened, like no one's given a shit after that. No, there's because there's no financial gain from it. The only gain was militarily, and you know, to show your power, also a source of national pride. You got to remember, at that time, kids literally in school were drilled on a nuclear attack. So in school, if you're a kid, they literally would do drills where kids had to, oh, you know, let's let's this is what we do: get into the desk, cover your neck. Doug remembers, I'm sure. This was, I'm serious. <laughs> never did one. You're lying. Yeah. I never did one. Really? Anyway, th- so this was a big thing uh, that a lot of kids in schools did. So it was, people were terrified. So it's like, what a great way to bring out national pride and also show the Soviets that we have the technology, we have the means. Oh, no, I Wasn't guess. there hysteria over Sputnik when they saw yes. the satellite coming over and everybody like freaked out? Well, yeah, the Russians had a satellite that floated above us. I mean, course. I get it. But the thing that I think is crazy is just that that much energy and effort and then to just shut it all down because we won the race. Yeah, and it's all over. I know. You would think that you would still want to go do it's, it just to prove that you could do it too. There's no oil on the moon. That's why. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, wasn't there talk about like some of the, the soil from the moon being used for some kind of converted energy? No, geez, man. No idea. <laughs> I, I had heard about that, but the, I, I think there's more plausibility in, in like a meteor. Like uh, I heard that there's, you know, some crazy valuable minerals on some of the meteor meteors that they're trying to mine. Yeah. Wasn't there a meteor that was made of like pure diamond or something like that? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. The planets, I thought. Maybe no? you're right. I don't know. I don't know. Hey, real quick. I hope you're enjoying the show. Head over to drinkolipop.com forward slash Mind pump. So Olipop are sodas, essentially, that have no sugar and that are good for your gut. They actually have compounds in them that help with gut health. I'm not making this up. They have great flavors, strawberry, orange, root beer, cola flavored, uh, but there's no sugar. Um, Again, low calorie, good for your gut. This stuff's actually quite amazing. Head over to drinkolipop.com forward slash mind pump. Use the code mind pump and get 15% off your order. By the way, there's a new flavor, grape flavor, or I like, or like I like to say, purple flavor. It's really, really good. Uh, back to the show. First question is from Caitlin T. Armstrong. What is a proper full range of motion for a squat? Is it bad to lock out your knees? Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. So the answer I'm going to give is actually the, the answer for proper range of motion for any exercise. So the proper range of motion is the fullest range of motion that you have complete control, strength, and stability to support. Okay. So if that means that the most you can do is a half squat, because anything outside of a half squat, you lose stability, you lose strength, uh, you lose balance, then that means that you have to train in that half squat. And then your goal is to improve that functional range of motion, improve your ability to go deeper while maintaining stability and control. This is true for all exercises. Now, the second part about locking out your knees, there's nothing wrong with straightening your legs up at the top of a squat. Now, here's the problem. If you lock your knees and relax your muscles so that the joints are supporting the weight, That's the problem. So it's like if I lock my elbows out on the end of a push-up, and then I relax my body and allow my joint being locked out to support me, well, that's the issue. But if I straighten my arms out or straighten my legs out and then stay tight with my muscles, 
Nothing wrong with that whatsoever. Now the only, the only yeah, any of, any of the joints that you're going to lock out and not support with your muscles is going to be an issue. I mean, this is why, like, if you're standing up in a, in a wedding and they tell you not to lock your knees, you might pass out. Like, there's all kinds of issues uh, you're going to run into that. But if you can support yourself with muscles, uh, you know, in, in the lockout, um, obviously that's something to to aspire to achieve. Now the only thing I don't like about that answer, even though it's the right one, is that. Somebody will hear uh, strength, stability, and control and think that because they can do it, even if their form breaks down, that they still are okay. Yeah, no. In other words, so like, you'll see someone, they'll do a squat and they can get ass to grass, but they also round their shoulders, their forward, their forward head, their chest falls way over their knees. The bar path now travels right. in front of the, in front of the knees, the heels might raise up a little bit and, be, but they technically can do it. They can get down there. And so I think that you, you have to elaborate a little bit on what strength and stability and control really means. It means you should be able to perform that movement with uh, proper form all the way through without any breakdown because even though you may be able to get deeper in the squat if there's any breakdown in your form in, in during that uh you know time you've got to stop at that point and right. so i think that's where people kind of mess up is they think they see somebody go ask to grass and go oh, i can get down there but they also heels are raising and like i said forward shoulder and head and the bar path is now traveling in front of the knees and so that's where I think this gets a little nuanced is you may think that you're you're able to go that deep, but for some people they can't do that with with proper form. No, you can have a, mm -hmm. you can have a full range of motion without good control and stability. And that's when the pro here's the deal. There are no dangerous exercises per se. There's only dangerous technique, form, lack of control, lack of stability. So it could be a barbell curl, one of the most basic exercises that exists. If you lack the control and stability for some reason in your elbow, then a barbell curl now becomes dangerous. Then we can pick an exercise that's extremely technical, an overhead squat, right? So this is where you have like a, it's like a, doing a snatch. You have a barbell up above your head, arms locked out, and you do a full squat. Very technical, requires excellent control, stability, and mobility. If you have all those prerequisites, if you have perfect form, perfect control, very safe exercise. Now, some exercises require more uh, prerequisites than others, right? Some are much more technical. A squat is a pretty technical exercise. But if you can do a full range of motion squat and you're doing it perfect and you've got the control, everything's tight, you own, essentially you own every part of the movement then it's perfectly safe and it's better to train with the full range of motion. There's just more benefits that you derive from it. Do you think it. it's become a, a really technical exercise because it's it, it's actually a fundamental movement that most of us have lost? Oh, yeah. The guys at Squat University yeah. did a really good post like a couple of weeks ago and I, I remember reading it and going like, I totally agree with this. And, that, and they were talking about just getting back to a place where that is... A normal movement instead of stop looking at it like this great strength building exercise that people should do to get big massive legs and stuff and it's just we should all have this ability to be able to sit down in that squatted position and the truth is we've just we've lost totally. that ability and because we've yeah. lost that ability it now makes that exercise such a technical difficult movement because there's so many problems that people have with getting down in that position. Oh, totally. I mean, okay, look at another movement pattern that humans literally evolved to do. There's very few things that humans do physically better than other animals. One of them is run. Okay, we actually in the animal kingdom are some of the best distance travelers that you'll find anywhere. You can actually out trek most animals uh, for distance. And this is because of the way we evolve. We've got these big knees, these huge glutes. We re use very little energy when we run. The problem is we forget how to run, so we lose the skill. So then we decide, I'm going to lace up my shoes and go running. And people, it's the number one thing that injures people is, is running. But if you ran since you were could walk and you did so barefoot and you always ran, you never stopped, it would be a very safe, uh, you know, great, movement for us. We evolved to do it, but we just stopped. So as far as squatting is concerned, 
think about it this way. When do you squat ever anywhere? I mean, yeah. you might squat down on the toilet, but even that doesn't look like a squat. People tend to plop down. We don't ever squat, so we just totally lose that that movement. Well, this is a bit of an aside, but uh, I was thinking about this, and I know um, uh, Strong by Science or, or Science by Strong, <laughs> Max Schmarzo, I forget his handle, but um, he was talking about how we – uh, get back into these rec league sports and uh, after you know years of of not training specifically in, in an athletic direction um and, and then jump into and meanwhile let's say you are working out let's say you are in the gym constantly and lifting weights but uh you're sticking in the hypertrophy t- style training and uh, now you have to explosively move you have to add all this rotation and and they wonder why all of a sudden uh, you know, these, these injuries occur and, and these, you know, joint pain and, and aches and all that. Um, but it's, it's really like what you maintain and, and, and what you train your body for um, in terms of, you know, what, what you're going to be able to keep up and, and, and have a high performance with. Yeah. Next question is from Nina Worgen. Can you provide recommendations to improve the front rack position? Oh, the front rack position. You know, do you guys just kind of side, let's go on the side here real quick. Do you guys think that this is for most people essential? Do you think this would be beneficial for most people? Do you think it's not really that beneficial unless you, this is like something you want to train? I think to to get to a place where you can do the front rack is very essential. I think it's a, a talking about what the last, uh, the last question just it's a fundamental uh, position you should be able to get your shoulders in. Mm-hmm. And most people can't because they lack the wrist mobility and the shoulder mobility yeah. Yeah. in order to get there. And so um, I, I think from that point of view, I think it's very fundamental and it's it's something that a lot of people struggle to do. That being said, uh, I don't think that you force it. I think you work towards getting to a place where you can do that. And I think it's in, I think just for good shoulder and wrist health, I think you should be able to do that. Yeah. I, I'd say the, the biggest thing that tends to hold people back is the wrist mobility, right? Is the wrist and, and mm-hmm. finger mobility. Wrist and shoulders. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a lot of stretches and movements you could do with your hands to work on this. If you don't have this mobility, take your time. This is something I have issues with. I don't even train it to be honest with you because I don't really want to spend the time working on it. But if I did, I would imagine it would probably take me at least six months of concentrated, you know, focused effort to be able to get in that position. Because if I did it now, there's no way I, I would, it would totally hurt my wrist. I, I think it's, it's sort of a keystone exercise in terms of unlocking a lot more exercises you can include in your programming. Um, You know, especially if you're getting into any kind of Olympic lifting or any types of more functional type of exercises as well. Um, But wrist health in general is something that I think a lot of people neglect and it comes back to bite them in the ass. Uh, And so to, to maintain that, I do find a lot of value in that and there's ways to do it where it's gradual. So if you, you know, are able to access kettlebells and and start there and just kind of uh, include these front rack kind of carrying exercises uh, and do that instead of like, uh, going with farmer carries, you, you can you can quickly sort of adapt uh, to that position. Um, you know, the more that you expose yourself to it, but obviously it has to be gradual and it has to be in a position where your wrist isn't like super aggravated. Um, but you know, there's lots of grades of of being able to get to the position where you could do you know a solid front rack front squat. Uh, you know, with a barbell and that is something that you can aspire and achieve. I I also think it's one of those things that's we're getting, it's getting worse. I just think with phones and computers, it's, you know, we're, we're in that, we're in this time where, uh, you know, God fast forward 10, 20 years from now. And it may be like what we were just talking about with the squat. Now, now everybody can't even get their wrist and their shoulders in that position anymore. And so, you know, another one of those areas of, you know, do we just accept that we can't do it and and, right. and yeah. find a crutch and use, you know, straps to hold it there or or do the, you know, cross your arms over and just accept that, oh, I don't have the shoulder and wrist mobility? Or is this a thing that we, we recognize that, oh, this is something that I want to be able to do as I get older because of what uh, problems may occur if I don't? And so working towards that, I think is important. I just, I mean, I'm not great at it, but, it, and it was an, an area though for, you know, my first half of lifting, I, I definitely used to cross my arms because I didn't have the good shoulder and wrist mobility to do it. 
but over time, I've, I've gotten to a place where I can hold the front rack position fairly well. Um, but it takes constant work. Now, what's cool, though, about and why I like exercises like this and then the pursuit of getting good at it, like the squat, if you can, once you get there, so long as you just keep it in the routine, it'll help promote that good wrist and shoulder mobility. You know, yeah. so if you get good at just like the deep squat, like I had to do a lot of work on my ankles and my hips to get to a deep squat. Now that I, I did all that work, so long as I keep those deep squats, it keeps good hip hip health and good ankle health for me. Same thing goes for your, your wrists and your, that's why this front rack position I think is so great is it might take a little bit of work to get to a place where you can do this well, but once you can do it, so long as you just maintain that exercise in your routine, you should have pretty good wrist and shoulder mobility. Yeah, so here's something you can do to, to help. It's very basic, very easy. You can literally get a barbell, get up into the position to where you're in that front rack position, and then just hold that for time. But don't relax the wrists in the sense that it's just sitting on the wrist and bending it back. When you're in that position, activate your wrist. Actually pull them back and activate the front of the forearms so you're activating yeah. the muscles while you're sitting in that position. And then hold it for like 15, 20, 30 seconds and practice this on a daily basis. This is one way to kind of get more comfortable uh, with that position. Yeah, do that. And also if you can get like some small gym towels and wrap it around, you know, the barbell uh, and sort of gradually work your way down um, yeah, yeah. It's, to grip it. So you have a neutral grip to start if the wrists are really – having a challenge with being able to flex like that. Um, that's a good way to kind of gradually bring them closer to the bar and then really challenge yourself to get, you know, your fingers to, to touch the bar and, and then maintain that position and just hold it isometrically. Next question is from Furtado, no Insta. How much muscle imbalance is normal? Well, if normal, if you mean, what is common, uh, a lot, <laughs> a lot of muscle yeah. imbalance is common. If you mean what is, I guess, ideal, you know, this is different um, from person to person. I would say you want to be, you want to have a good quality of life and you don't want to have muscle imbalances that cause any dysfunction or pain. So you want to be able to move in your daily life, do normal things, play with your kids, do your workouts and not have any joint pain or problems. One of the easiest ways, by the way, to help, and this isn't this isn't the answer for everything, okay? This is just a very general way to kind of help with muscle imbalances, is to do a lot of unilateral work, is to just do stuff one arm at a time, one leg at a time. This, although it's not the answer, like I said, to everything, it does help a lot because when you, it, it really does illuminate quite a bit. Like you do a one arm chest press and you may notice like, oh my gosh, I didn't realize my left shoulder raises up so much when I do that or a one arm row or, you know, uh, like what, you know, one legged step up or toe touch or lateral exercises with one leg at a time that does illuminate quite a bit. And then we've said this before on the podcast, real good rule of thumb is the side that is weaker and less stable, start with that side and then have that side dictate what you do with the other side so that you're not training your good side more than your weaker side. Allow it to catch up. I think it's really common, and I don't think anybody is perfectly symmetrical. Um, so mm -hmm. in, in, in that sense, that's normal, I guess. Uh, I think a good goal is to try and minimize the discrepancy from left to right as much as possible. So, you know, to Sal's point about doing the unilateral work, I think that's a great way to, to, to measure this and pay attention to it. Um, but that's kind of what I'm always looking at is uh, I know that I'm never going to be perfectly symmetrical. I know I'm always going to have a more dominant side than the other side. But I want to minimize the discrepancy from left to right as much as I possibly can. So everything from mobility and strength and control. So I want to be able to what I can do on my left side, I want to be able to do on my right side as close to equal as I can. And I think a good goal is to pursue that, whether you'll ever achieve it. I think it's a good gauge or measure on, you know, trying to counter all these imbalances that we all have. But I, I think it's an it's an impossible pursuit, uh, just because I think that's just not how the body works. I think you're you're going to tend to lean heavily on your dominant yeah. side always. But the pursuit of trying to make that as close to as uh, evenly as possible, I think, is a good goal. 
Yeah, your body's always going to be compensating, uh, and this is just going to change all the time. And so um, that's why these um, reassessments are really important to, and, and this is why we created something like Prime, where it's just a very basic test to see, uh, you know, you, you monitor your joint function and just to see, like, if your, uh, your abilities are still there to be able to do, like, normal function of the joint. Um, and so I'm every now and then I'm just, you know, checking up on that to see what I've been neglecting because inevitably you get into patterns, um, and your, your body's going to adapt towards those patterns. So, um, to be able to kind of look at that, but my goal is always to maintain a certain level of, uh, you know, primal movement patterns as some people call it, um, in terms of squatting, in terms of, you know, being able to, to, to run, to, to be able to throw, to be able to jump or, or, you know, certain abilities I want to maintain. Uh, I have to be able to train that because otherwise my body's going to prioritize other things. And, and so some of these abilities are going to kind of go right out from under you. Um, but yeah, you're, you're always going to have imbalances. That's just inevitable just because we don't do the same exact thing on both sides uh, all day long. Uh, it's just a, a matter of, uh, making sure that your priorities are met and also that your, your joints are fully capable of, you know, the kind of range of motion you want and the stability and support. Next question is from BBXH. Can you do social level adult sports such as soccer and bodybuilding or do they conflict? All right. It depends on what you mean by do they co uh, conflict, right? Does lifting weights improve your ability to play soccer and other sports? Yes, it does. It can actually make you much faster and more stable and strong. If your goal is to be the best bodybuilder you could possibly be, then yeah, playing, you know, focusing a lot of energy in anything else is going to take away from that. You know, we get this question all the time and I think it's, you have to understand one thing. If you want to have extreme performance in one pursuit then oftentimes, unless the other stuff that you're doing is geared towards complementing that, you can't also pursue that kind of extreme performance and other attributes and not expect to have some detriment, okay? So you can't be the best soccer player uh, of, of your life and also be the best bodybuilder of your life. There's going to be some, some give and take, but can you do them together, have a good quality of life and Get benefits for sure. both? Absolutely. Sure. Absolutely. If your goal is to, you know, enjoy what you're doing and, you know, maybe lift some weights to complement soccer, I mean, that's a wonderful approach. But I think people put too much, they, they fear this too much, you know what I mean? So they're like, you know what, I'm not doing anything else, I'm just going to lift weights. It's like, are you going to be like a super bodybuilder? Is that what you want to do? Or yeah. are you just trying to be fit and healthy? In I, which case, do you I feel like it wouldn't be a qua if we didn't have this question. I feel I like we get every, <laughs> every know, right? qua... We have pretty much this exact question just worded differently and, you know, insert different sport, different aesthetic goal. But it's, you know, can I be a buff soccer player? Like, yes, of course you can. You know, lift lift weights and play soccer. You're going to be a pretty buff looking soccer player. I don't think, but it's just, are they conflicting? Well, they there's different attributes that make a great soccer player and there's different attributes that make a great bodybuilder. It's just that simple. And you're going to have to put some of your effort in one of those directions. And so if you are going to put them in one direction, you're going to limit yourself in the other one. It's that, but you doesn't mean you can't be a, a really fit looking soccer player or that has good amount of muscle mass on you. And it doesn't mean you can't be a bodybuilder who actually plays soccer fairly well. I mean, you can definitely do yeah. that. This, you're not going to be the best, like Sal said, the best version of yourself at it, doing both of them because they are different goals. I do. I do. I, I totally agree. I do have one thing though, that, that really drives me crazy though with professional athletes when they seek out a bodybuilding coach to train them all in hypertrophy leading into their uh, very sport specific uh, pursuit uh, and I've seen this time and time again with with NFL athletes and MMA athletes uh, where they're literally just training like a bodybuilder leading up and then they they totally shit the bed when they go to perform yeah I think you have to be the the area you probably have to be the most careful is if you were an athlete. So if you're playing soccer on a fairly regular basis, uh, you, the amount of, you know, bodybuilding I would be doing would be minimal. 
Uh, and mainly just for... Uh, I would compliment. Do it to compliment, right? Right. It would be just enough. I mean, one to two days a week is about all you want to be doing because I'd be more worried about uh, injury, right? I'd be more worried about training so hard and heavy to look a certain way. Then I go out on the field and I try to do something explosive and then I end up pulling or tearing something. And so... That that's the one thing you got to be careful when you when you are chasing a bodybuilding goal while also playing a sport. This is this is true for sports too. Like I want to at some point, right? When you're a kid, you do it all. I mean, studies show if you do it all, you you do specific sports better by doing it that way. But at some point, you specialize, and then all your other training is geared towards that specialization. This is why it's so rare. It's so rare to see a professional athlete who's a professional in multiple sports. And the only one that comes to mind for me is Bo Jackson. I can't think of anybody else that I'm, – I'm sure there were others. You guys probably know. I don't, I don't know of any other athletes that Played were able to – sports? Yeah, that were Deion professional. Sanders, Deion yeah. Sanders. Deion no. Sanders, yeah. But super rare, right? Because that's really hard to, yeah, to, to focus all your, your focus and technique and skills and, and be so good that you can be the, you know a pro level in one sport and then do it – and another, if you, and I, I think I know what they're, what they're really asking when they ask this question is, am I going to lose some gains? Am I going to lose some aesthetics? I mean, I don't know, maybe if it's real extreme, I bet you most people would probably not, they probably look better just because they're doing more activity. But if you, let's say you're an advanced bodybuilder, let's say you've been lifting weights for four years and bodybuilding has been your focus and that's all you've done for four years and you've maximized muscular development. And then you're like, you know what? I'm going to start playing soccer four days a week. Therefore, I'm going to lift weights only once or twice a week. Are you going to lose some of your bodybuilding gains? Yeah, of course. Of course you are because your focus has moved a little bit more in another direction. But I think people put too much weight into something like that. They worry too much about this. Um, unless you're at that extreme yeah. level, who cares? Like, go and enjoy. Well, especially at the rec league level, like they're saying. Like, yeah. we're just doing this as a weekend work. But you just got to be cognizant, too, that, uh, you know, you're putting that excess amount of force and stress around the joint. So I would make sure at least you incorporate a bit more mobility in your rituals uh, going into something like that so you can just uh, maintain the health of, of yeah. your ankles, your knees, everything else. Uh, that to me, that's the most important part of this conversation is that I, actually almost all of my injuries that have happened in basketball have been probably because I was training so consistently to be a bodybuilder and put mass and size and build, and then I go get out on a basketball court and think that I'm going to be able to move the same as I was moving when I was 19 years old. And now I've got these overdeveloped quads and glutes, but then I had terrible ankle mobility and stability, and there goes my Achilles, right? Mm -hmm. Or. I don't, right. I don't have the same rotational strength with this new body that's 230 pounds that I did when I was 180 pounds. And so that's what you got to be probably most cautious of is if you have put a lot of energy and effort towards building a bigger uh, physique, a body bodybuilding, and then you decide to pick up a, a rec league sport, whether it be soccer, or basketball, or like that, and not realizing that you haven't trained that new version of your body to be capable of doing some of these explosive totally. movements, and that's normally where the injury occurs. So this happens has happened to me multiple times, so I need to take my own advice here, but that's probably what I'd be most concerned about yeah. when I ask this question, less about, oh, well, I still look good or whatever, is if I've been really focused on building a buff body and then I go play a sport that I haven't been training for is the the likelihood of potentially tearing something or hurt injuring yourself. Yeah, very good point. Look, if you like our information, head over to mindpumpfree.com. Check out all of our free guides. So we have guides that'll help you build muscle, burn body fat, look better, feel better, and perform better. Again, it's mindpumpfree.com. You can also find all of us on Instagram. So you can find Justin at mindpumpjustin, me at mindpumpsal, and Adam at mindpumpadam.